the construction of the World Trade Center was an incredible breakthrough in skyscraper design. It was the project of the century. Everybody wanted to work on the World Trade Center. The latest in building technology allowed designers to go bigger and higher than anything the world had ever seen. It was just whammo, you know, the two biggest skyscrapers in the world. But then came the 11th of September, 2001. It's still not known how many people perished in this nightmare of collapsing steel and dust. Now, as the site is cleared, serious questions are emerging about the buildings themselves. Just why were so many unable to escape? And most importantly, was the collapse of the World Trade Center inevitable? New evidence suggests that the buildings may have been uniquely vulnerable to the attack and that their design prevented people from escaping before one of the world's most renowned buildings was reduced to this. Less than three miles from where the towers once stood, clues to their collapse lie in gigantic, twisted heaps in this New Jersey scrapyard. Time is short. The piles of high-strength steel evidence are being cut into chunks for export to recycling plants in the Far East the deals with the scrap merchants have already been made. As each massive piece arrives, huge grappling machines struggle with lumps of metal that weigh over twice as much as the trucks used to transport them. The very ground shakes as they drop just a few feet. That some of this steel fell a quarter of a mile to earth is difficult to believe. And how anyone inside survived is hard to imagine. But a few did survive, among them firemen, who witnessed the destruction from the inside of a stairwell as the North Tower collapsed on top of them. We were all in this little pocket in this stairway be between the fourth and the second floor. And this unbelievable sound, uh, I still remember the sound, of steel, these massive steel beams that are roughly five feet deep twisting around us like they were little twist ties off a loaf of bread. Uh, I'll, I'll never, never forget it. The reason the Twin Towers fell is obvious. They were, after all, hit by large aircraft carrying many tons of jet fuel. But at the same time, it's not at all clear that any other skyscraper would have collapsed so soon or so completely. The person who might just know more about the World Trade Center than anyone is the structural engineer who built it. His offices in this lower Manhattan building once boasted a commanding view of the complex. Now they overlook one of the biggest salvage operations New York has ever seen. 
the responsibility for arriving, if you will, at the at the ultimate strength of the tower was mine. And and the fact that they didn't stand longer uh, could be laid at my feet. Uh, do I feel guilty about it, about the fact that they collapsed? The circumstances on the 11th of September were outside of that which we considered in the design. Today, if I knew than what I know now, they would have stood longer, of course. Back in the 60s, when terrorist strikes were not a credible threat, the towers won many awards for their engineering, which was cutting edge for its day. The way in which they were built and eventually collapsed was due to the extraordinary demands made by the scale of the project. The complex was to have more office space than the entire city of Cincinnati, taller than anything ever built in a town where high winds can be a severe problem. And all of this to solve a common blight inner city decay. In the mid-60s, American cities were very troubled. There was poverty, there was crime, there were race riots, there was a lot of worry about whether or not they could even survive. New York was troubled. There was a lot of worry about New York's future. It was decided that a rundown section of the city known as Radio Row should be demolished and replaced with a high-tech, landmark building, something fitting for a country poised to embark on the space race. It was a classic American response to a problem, which is hit it right down the middle with as much firepower as you can give it. Two 110-story boxes, the tallest towers in the world, well, that was gonna fix everything, right? That's how we thought in the 1960s. Back then, the man in charge was Guy Tuzzoli, who 35 years later saw the towers fall as he drove to work. Honestly, I never thought the towers would collapse. It, it just never occurred to me. It, it, we had, it, they had stood there since 1970 when we opened, and it just didn't seem possible. I remember I cried, sitting in the car. In happier times, Mr. T, as he was known to his staff, was put in charge of what the Reader's Digest called the biggest building project since the pyramids. My job was to make a program so which the architects would follow. How many feet of office space, how many feet of consumer service area, a place for customs, a hotel and then to find the architectural team that could carry it out. The architect was to be Minoru Yamasaki, or Yama, as he was known, a Japanese-American who died in 1986. He conceived of a pair of 80-story towers sprouting from a huge open plaza. But even these giants would not have been enough office space for Mr. T. I said, well, does it meet our program? No, he said, it's not, it's two million square feet short. Well, I said, why is that? Well, he said, you can't build a building taller than 80 floors. And I said, why? Well, he said, because the elevatoring in buildings taller than 80 floors make it impossible to be uh, rentable. The problem was that with a building over 80 stories tall, so much of the lower floors are taken up with the elevators needed to service the upper floors that the building becomes uneconomic. But this minor issue wasn't going to stop Guy Tuzzoli. And I remember saying to Yama, Yama, President Kennedy is gonna put a man on the moon. 
I think you could build us the tallest buildings in the world. The problem was solved by treating each third of the skyscraper as a separate 40-story building, so that fewer elevator shafts would be needed. This pattern was repeated three times, and the whole system was linked together with two express elevators that would go the whole height of the building. If you went to an upper floor of the World Trade Center, you didn't get in the elevator at the ground floor and go to your floor. You got into a big, giant elevator that was an express to what was called a sky lobby. And there you switched for a local elevator to your individual floor. That's what they did, and that's how the buildings happened. Solving the elevator problem meant that it was now possible to build on an unprecedented scale, to construct towers that would eventually become synonymous with America itself. We were constructing a building which put up high in the air a huge amount of rentable space, much more so than any building in the past or indeed any building today. In order to do that, we had to rethink the whole process of designing and the technology that went into the design. It quickly became clear that New York's occasional 100 mile an hour windstorms would be the dominant factor. The lateral push of the wind on the World Trade Center is perhaps four or five times larger than the earthquake load would be if you build it in Los Angeles or in Tokyo. Such a vast building would be blown around in the wind, not only backwards, but from side to side as well. We had to think about the dynamics of the motion of the building, not just the fact that it leaned a little bit in the wind. The solution was to make the building of high strength steel, concentrated in the exterior walls, a unique and dramatic departure from conventional skyscraper design. Most skyscrapers are built on steel or concrete frames, which is a grid of columns and beams that goes all the way through the building. The World Trade Center was different. It was what engineers call a tube structure. It was a very, very strong mesh of steel that surrounded the exterior. The way these walls were built was equally ingenious. Three 30-foot long columns were welded together off-site to make a relatively lightweight yet rigid prefabricated panel. This was then hoisted up to join thousands of similar pieces, forming an enormously strong wall of steel. In the middle stood a steel core, which would contain all the stairwells and elevators, allowing for one of the tower's major selling points, large open floor spaces. Tenants like open space. It's flexible. It allows them to have big open rooms if they want or to put temporary partitions anywhere they please. There was another advantage to the system it would save money. You could do a tube structure with roughly half the amount of steel than you would need for a conventional frame that goes all the way through the structure, but it would hold up just as well, it would be just as strong. The end result was a building of extraordinary structural efficiency. Hundreds of acres of office space held high in the sky by the minimum amount of steel. Steel that now lies in a scrapyard and holds the secret of how this revolutionary design came undone. The World Trade Center was built at an astonishing rate three floors every two weeks, 
Steel came from all over America and beyond, arriving just in time to be hoisted to a new home in the sky. Efficiency was a buzzword taken seriously by everyone on the team, especially project manager Guy Tozzoli. Well, the first thing I did is I scheduled meetings of 17 minutes. That was the maximum you could have my time. And, and, and I took it religiously that way. And you got an answer. Uh, that was very important. Because if, we, if anything was delayed, $1 million a day to stop this project. And it had to be done on time. Every aspect of the design was optimized in order to save weight and therefore cost. The steel varied in strength and thickness from tower to tower, since, as a pair, the buildings would shelter each other slightly from the wind. The two towers are different. They're, they're different in, in many ways, and to me, they are not twins. They are, they were. Oh, I have that problem. Present tense, past tense. They were different, and I thought of them that way. I always thought of them as, as together, that is, brother and sister, or two brothers and whatever, or two sisters, but not as twins. I always thought of them as different. The final job was to place a 350-ton TV antenna on the top of the North Tower, taking its total height to 1,719 feet. But already, the winds of architectural fashion had changed and the towers were harshly received by the critics. They were all but ignored by the architecture community except to sneer at them from time to time. And I remember saying that they were just utterly banal and how sad it was that the biggest buildings in New York were the dullest. Architects may not have liked them, but they were a hit with the public. And one incident in particular helped to break the ice between the severe, minimalist structures and the fiery population. I had a direct connection to the police desk, and the light went on as I'm driving to work in the morning, and the sergeant on duty says, Mr. T, Mr. T, we have a problem at the World Trade Center. I said, what is it? He said, there's a guy walking on a tightrope between the two buildings, what should we do? And I couldn't think of it. I said, tell him not to fall off. The daredevil was a Frenchman named Philippe Petit. <laughs> then then I, I called back about 15 minutes later, and I said, you know, I've been thinking about it. I could use the publicity, so don't arrest them. <laughs> but the city of New York police said he must be arrested. The judge called me after he had, had him in court, and he said, he's such a nice young man, what should he do? I said, just don't, don't hurt him. So Philippe Petit was given a, a, a sentence. He did a free show for children, crippled children, in Central Park. He crossed the pond, if you would. And Philippe and I became very good friends. <laughs> The World Trade Center stood for 23 years without serious incident. Apart from a few small office fires and the odd jammed elevator, the buildings led an uneventful existence. Gradually, the floors began to fill up. Numbers one and two World Trade Center, as the towers were officially called, began to worm their way into the hearts of New Yorkers. By the time the terrible events of September 11th happened, I think most people had actually made a piece with the Trade Center as a piece of architecture. They may not have loved it, but they liked it. They saw it as a benign presence, as part of the landscape of New York, and expected and counted on seeing it forever. The first terrorist attack on the towers took place on February the 26th, 1993. A rented van packed with hydrogen canisters and the equivalent of half a ton of dynamite was driven into the garage beneath the complex. Although they had no access inside the towers themselves, the terrorists got as close as they could, parking the van two floors down 
six feet from the subterranean south wall of the North Tower. At 18 minutes past 12, the bomb exploded. Six people were killed and 1,042 injured in what was, at that time, the biggest terrorist attack ever carried out on American soil. The towers acted like giant chimneys, sucking smoke from the blast upwards through the stairwells and elevator shafts, which were full of people trying to get out. The intention had been to demolish the base of the North Tower and cause it to fall into the South. But the terrorists had not anticipated the extraordinary strength of this tube of steel. The bomb, the bomb was a serious bomb, <laughs> but in terms of, of a building of the scale of the World Trade Center, it was not a significant event in terms of the tower. Now, outside of the tower, it was another matter completely. The bomb failed to demolish the towers because it exploded outside the perimeter wall. The blast merely bounced off and shattered several floors of the parking garage and a machinery space below. The next time the terrorists attacked, the outcome would be different. Because, eight years later, they finally managed to penetrate the tower's defenses. From this point on, the building's design meant that the collapse was inevitable. When the first 200-ton airliner smashed into the World Trade Center, traveling at over 400 miles an hour, it seemed that the building had survived the attack. But in fact, serious damage had occurred inside, cutting off vital escape routes and initiating the process by which the towers fell. Naval architect George Slay was at his desk on the 91st floor of the North Tower at 8.46 a.m. I was on the phone, I heard a roar, looked out the window and saw uh, this passenger jet coming towards the building. Uh, it was only about two or three plane lengths away from me at that point and I didn't really have time to react. It was just, uh, I saw it and then it was into the building. George's office was just below the point at which nearly 200 tons of Boeing 767 had struck the tower. Our offices are between the two arrowheads, and my office was particularly to the first three windows to the right of this arrowhead in this area here. It doesn't get much closer than that. My office kind of collapsed around me. Um, one of my colleagues came uh, rushing along to see if I was okay and offered to drag me out. I politely refused. I said I was okay and crawled out myself. At six minutes past nine, as onlookers watched in horror, the second plane hit. Sautine C, wife of engineer Leslie Robertson and a partner with the firm, watched from the window overlooking the complex. Well, after the first tower was hit, all of us were gathered around the windows on the north side looking towards the north tower, which was burning, and, um, and I was standing by this window with lots of other people in the office when uh, we saw the 
this blue and red plane coming by and uh, smash into the uh, South Tower. And uh, people thought it was a movie, but, you know, it was unreal. We were so stunned. Nobody believed that th this was for real. In the weeks and months that have passed since that horrifying day, the complete set of plans and drawings that are kept in this office has been under intense scrutiny. These plans graphically illustrate why many in the building did not escape. These are the uh, architectural drawings of the World Trade Center North Tower, Tower A. And this is the 94th floor, which is very close to the uh, floors of impact on the North Tower. And the plane came in from the north side, so broad side onto the core. The core is from here to here and from there to there. If an outline of the aircraft is laid over the plans, the scale of the impact becomes clear. With a wingspan and length of 157 feet, the plane must have devastated the central core, destroying the escape routes at the same time. All means of escape were now blocked for those above the impact. The design that so ingeniously allowed the wide open floor spaces had also concentrated the elevators and staircases in the central core. For almost everyone above floor 77 in the south tower, or floor 91 in the north tower, there was no way out. I think I, talking to some of the other people in our office, um, when we first went into the stairwell, the people who investigated the stairwells looked up and they could see that the, the stairwells were blocked above us. There didn't seem to be, and there's a lot of debris there and there was nobody coming down from, from, from floors above us. The elevator shafts were also severed by the planes and tons of aviation fuel poured into them, starting fires throughout the building. Elevator operator Kelly Badillo was in the North Tower when the first plane hit. I think uh, the, one of the elevators, the lower ones, I think uh, they, the cables broke or something because they, um, they just came f flying down, sh boom. You could hear them. You could hear the lot of the elevators. And then you could hear the wind, sh like a wind tunnel. But a lot of the elevators came crashing down. Doors flying right open, boom, hitting the other side of the wall and everything. Standing in the lobby, Kelly witnessed the destruction of the very system that had made the buildings possible in the first place. One of them came down and it hit the floor, or it hit halfway or something, and the doors, they, they, uh, one of them flew open, and then people started coming out that elevator, and they had their hair was on fire. You could see the smoke coming off their jackets and everything. And they just kept on running. Once they, kept, once they got out of the bay, everybody just kept on running. Although few people survived from above the impact points, the fact that the buildings remained standing undoubtedly saved many lives. The fact that they were designed to resist over 13,000 tons of wind pressure meant they could not be knocked over. In a remarkably prescient interview given over 15 years ago, Charlie Thornton, one of the investigators, considered the scenario. Well, 13,000 tons is a lot of force. Uh, people always talk about an airplane crashing into a building. And in 1944 or 45, a plane did crash into the Empire State Building. Since the Empire State accident demonstrated that a plane could crash into a New York skyscraper, the designers were forced to consider the possibility taking the example of a Boeing 707 passenger jet, one of a new generation of heavy civil aircraft. The airplane we were envisioning was the largest airplane of its time, uh, fly, flying slowly and low, lost in the fog, in any, in any event, we designed the buildings to take the impact 
of the Boeing 707 uh, hitting the building at any location. But the aircraft that hit the towers was a Boeing 767, heavier than a 707, fueled for a transcontinental flight and traveling fast. The energy uh, contained in, in, in an airplane or any other moving object is proportional to the square of the velocity, double the velocity, and you have four times the energy. And so the energy imposed on the building by the 767 was very substantially more than the energy that we had assumed in design. Although the impacts were far more powerful than what the engineers had envisioned, and the damage far more extensive than anything ever imagined, the towers did not fall. The enormous weight from above was supported by the columns on either side of the gaping hole. But the buildings were now stressed far beyond their design calculations, and the next phase of the tragedy would undo what little strength was left. These were the biggest buildings in New York City. Each floor was one, one acre in area. And we looking at, we're looking at this and we see uh, smoke issuing under pressure for at least the top 20 floors, maybe more. So you're looking at, if we're using the 20 floor figure, you're looking at 20 acres of fire. Although the designers of the World Trade Center had considered the possibility of an aircraft impact, it seems no one had calculated the effects of the fuel on the structure. To the best of my knowledge, the considerations of the fuel in the airplane in terms of, a, of, a, of an explosion or a great fire was not considered. Now, we, we were not responsible for that aspect of the design, so I, maybe I'm wrong, but I believe it was not considered, and further I believe that had it been considered, it would have been proven to be impossible to, to deal with it. As thousands of gallons of aviation kerosene burned, hundreds of firefighters were dispatched to the scene, although in reality, the sheer scale and design of the buildings meant there was little they could do to save them. A typical firefighting hose team can extinguish approximately 2,500 square feet. That's an area 25 by 100. If you get two attack hose lines side by side, they may be able to extinguish about 5,000 square feet of fire. The World Trade Center floor areas were 40,000 square feet. They're building these high-rise office buildings with open floor design and creating spaces almost 10 times more than the area we can extinguish with hose streams. The way in which steel-framed buildings behave in fires depends on their construction. In this test, done by British Steel in 1995, a large amount of typical office furniture was burned to see what would happen to the heavy steel beams that supported the ceiling. When steel is bare, when it heats up, uh, it uh, gets weaker. It's not that it melts in a fire. In fact, uh, the fires, normal fires, are not hot enough to melt steel. Even if you were, for example, to uh, use an unusual uh, fuel like um, kerosene, you cannot achieve temperatures hot enough to melt steel. But what happens is it starts to lose its strength. And as it loses its strength, uh, it starts to sag. It, it becomes uh, softer and sags and can no longer support the load. This was the largest test of its kind ever conducted. It showed how unprotected steel can be distorted even by a normal office fire. But as is typical in steel buildings, the structural beams only slowly and progressively warped and sagged. There was no chance of a sudden collapse. In over 20 years, um, I have not seen, until recently, 
a protected steel structure that has collapsed in a fire. So what was the cause of the devastating, explosive failure that happened to the World Trade Center? How did such a massively strong steel building suddenly give way and come crashing down? I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that actually it collapsed like the way it did. Like everyone else, it was totally out of your human capacity to digest it and absorb it. Professor Hassan Astane is carrying out an analysis of the twisted remains that lie in the New Jersey scrapyard. He has been studying the condition of the steel columns in an attempt to find out what the collapse mechanism could have been. What you see here is actually very critical, very, very important. Perhaps this is the most important piece I have found so far. This piece comes from uh, most likely Tower 2, where the plane went in and exploded. This is the inside face of back columns. So plane went in, exploded right here, and the explosion hit this surface. What you see here is, first of all, a bend that is due to explosion. But more importantly, this is a signature of explosion here. This has happened due to explosive material hitting this column and, and making that bulge. So this is the floor where explosion happened. And the windows are blown away, everything is burned. Even fireproofing on this floor is burned and glazed to the steel. The fireproofing in the World Trade Center was a sprayed on dry, fragile material made of mineral fibers. Designed to protect the steel from heat, it appears that the fireproofing may have actually been blown away by the blasts from the impacts. Although every piece of steel in this scrapyard was treated, very little of the coating can be found. This piece, as you can see, has been burned. You can see the smoke and the fire effect on it. You can see some fireproofing, but really not much of it is left. So you can see that when the building was burning, there was no fireproofing left. The lack of fireproofing meant that the steel was extremely vulnerable to the heat from the kerosene. But what has intrigued investigators above all is that it may have had a disastrous effect on one particular part of the structure, the support for the massive open plan floors. At the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Professor Eduardo Kausel has been carrying out research into the disaster. In retrospect, and we can always play uh, the general after the war, we can, we can see what went wrong and what you could have done differently. And uh, perhaps the, the Achilles tendon of the, of the World Trade Center is the way that the floors were supported with the columns. The, the connection between the floors and the columns. It was in my view, these were relatively weak connections. The floor system was unusual for its time. Instead of the thick steel beams that are normally used, the floors were supported with lightweight structures called trusses. A steel deck was placed over them to form prefabricated panels, which were then hoisted into position. They were fastened at each end to brackets welded to the wall. Once in place, each floor was covered with a four-inch layer of concrete. This system was one of the reasons the towers could be built so quickly, since each floor was largely pre-assembled down on the ground. But the drawback with such lightweight trusses is that they can be very susceptible to fire. There is no other construction technique that has killed more firefighters than trusses. We have a saying in the fire service, don't trust 
the trust. They fail during fire. For example, 40 years ago, the fire protection engineers told us that an unprotected steel truss will fail within five or 10 minutes of fire exposure. Trusses are highly efficient. They are extremely strong for their weight. But because they are so light, they heat up very quickly in a fire. And unless they are well protected with fireproofing, they will start to bend and distort. With the fireproofing damaged or removed completely, this was the first part to be affected by the inferno raging in the towers. This computer simulation done at MIT shows how heating the trusses causes them to fail. What this, this simulation shows is that the most likely, the weak point of the floor where the connections to the supports and it might have started failing at, that, at those locations first. Either the external uh, connection to the columns or the internal connection. The heavily distorted brackets that remain in the scrapyard suggest exactly the same thing to Professor Astine. You cannot bend the steel like this without cracking it, unless you warm it up. So what, tells me, what this piece tells me is that this piece was very hot when the floor collapsed and bent it. So that must have been the initiation of collapse of this World Trade Center top. As the floors began to fail, the last terrible phase of the destruction started. The efficiency of the design meant that with any major element removed, the whole structure would fall. The reason why is best demonstrated with a simple wooden model. Um, we have here two uh, frame structures. Basically, these are the columns, and these are three floors. And I'm uh, certain that we had fires, and these fires uh, caused the, this floor basically to fail and drop onto the floors below, underneath. So once this floor was gone, we had a situation similar to this one here, where this intermediate floor disappeared, basically dropped. This changes dramatically the way in which the loads and the building are carried. Let me illustrate this by adding uh, weights here to this structure. And uh, this load again that I just added is transmitted through these columns all the way to the table. The important thing to understand is this floor does not carry any of this load. This, the only function of this floor is to connect the columns together, to tighten the columns together and prevent them from buckling. The model on the left is able to take a very large amount of weight. But the one with the missing floor is only able to support a quarter of that amount before its columns twist and buckle, and it collapses. This is the mechanism that almost certainly caused the collapse of the World Trade Center, the fire destroying the floors that kept the walls standing. After burning for 53 minutes, the South Tower collapsed in 11 seconds. Thirty minutes later, the North Tower crumbled. Once it was in progress, nothing could stop it. By the time the tops of the buildings had fallen just the height of a single story, they had gathered enough momentum to smash each floor underneath accelerating until all 500,000 tons hit the ground at 120 miles an hour. The World Trade Center was an extraordinary building that faced an extraordinary and devastating terrorist attack. It now seems that its daring and innovative design hastened its tragic destruction. I'm a human being. I have, I have trouble sleeping, and I, it's very tough. It's very tough to be the structural engineer for a building that, that collapsed and killed a lot of people. It's very tough. 
We can only hope that from this tragedy will come a better understanding of how high-rise buildings react to fire. Also, that protection from terrorist attack will become a new and urgent priority.